the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven. God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless in God's presence before the creation of the world. God destined us to be his adopted children through Jesus Christ because of his love. This was according to his goodwill and plan, and honor his glorious grace that he has given us freely through the Son whom he loves. We have been ransomed through his Son's blood, and we have forgiveness for our failures based on his overflowing grace, which he poured over us with wisdom and understanding. God revealed his hidden design to us, which is according to his goodwill and plan that he intended to accomplish through his Son. This is what God planned for the climax of all times, to bring all things together in Christ, the things in heaven, along with the things on earth. We have also received an inheritance in Christ. We were destined by the plan of God, who accomplishes everything according to his design. We are called to be an honor to God's glory, because we were the first to hope in Christ. You too heard the word of truth in Christ, which is the good news of your salvation. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit because you believed in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the down payment on your inheritance, which is applied toward our redemption as God's own people, resulting in the honor of God's glory. shall we? Gracious and holy God, this is your day. The day that you gave us to find rest and peace and restoration of the people. Grant us new light, new life, new hope. Bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts. Might it be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God designed, destined us to be his adopted children through Jesus Christ because of his love. Adopted children. I've had a couple friends in my life who have been adopted. One of them, we'll call him Mark, was adopted as an infant. And he and I were close friends. Mark always struggled with the question of why. Why is it that I was, in his mind, not good enough for my parents, for my mother to keep? And I think this question really resides in a lot of people's hearts and minds who have been adopted. It has nothing to say to the family who has chosen them to be their child. But just as little reading this question, so much so that there's a TV show that Jenny and I enjoy every once in a while called Long Lost Family. Not sure what network it's on, but um, it's these people who get help in finding their birth mother and father, or both. And um, some reunion that takes place if both parties are agreeable to it. Sometimes there are people who have given up children for adoption looking for their child, wondering what happened to them. In Mike's case, it was never, no matter how much love his family poured out upon him, his family was one of the closest families to mine and very loving people. He and his brother were both adopted, at least they weren't from the same mother they didn't think. And his brother Todd one day made an announcement that, uh, to his mom, his adopted mom, that he was going to go find his family. And he had somehow located them in California. He went out there and kind of in this rage and this hate, maybe as a 20 year old, he said to his adopted mother, You know, I'm going to go find my real family. And it's going to be awesome. Well, Todd found his brother. They had some conversations. His brother said, oh, you got a car. Yeah, can you help me out with something? He said, sure. 
So they went to an address, and his brother said, stay here for a minute. He went in the house, and a couple minutes later, he came out carrying a flat screen TV. Can you help me put this in the back of the car? Todd's like, what's going on? Oh, my friend said I could borrow this. And he had realized that he had just participated in a robbery when they drove away. In some cases, the idea of family doesn't always work out. With the birth family and that image of how it's going to be when we're reunited. Mark heard the story of his brother's success and grew even more <coughs> weary and would eventually take his life. I was asked to do his funeral. What do you say in those situations? To someone who feels unloved, uncared for. And as I thought about it, I thought back to Moses. Moses may be the first person that we know of that was adopted, at least according to the scriptures. Right? His mother to protect him, leave him on the Nile. Here he's raised in this beautiful family who he's lavished on with all sorts of gifts. Right? He lives a lifestyle no other Hebrew got to live. He got an education and established bonds with his new Egyptian family. But as you know, after some struggles with the ethic way in which his Hebrew people were being treated, Moses commits murder and on the run finds himself in the land of Midian, where a woman comes to, you know, his fancy, and he decides, you know, it's time for me to settle down. And the scriptures tell us in Exodus 2, 21 through 22, Moses agreed to come and live with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses as his wife. She gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, because, quote, he said, I have been an immigrant living in a foreign land. Author and pastor Ruth Haley Barton believes that much of our life is discovering that we have created this protective shell around us in order for us to survive the world that we live in. And much of the Christian journey is to realize that that is not who we were created to be and to break ourselves out of our shell. And in her book on Christian leadership, she says this is Moses' moment of cracking the shell. A naming and claiming, I am a foreigner in a foreign land. What family does Moses have? He doesn't look like his Egyptian family. He's not welcomed by his Hebrew family because of the way in which he grew up. And so at the moment in which he holds his son for the first time and in the patriarchal manner that was allowed in the day, he named his son his greatest concern. I'm a foreigner in a foreign land. Naming and claiming who we are helps us to identify where we're going. And in Moses' case, he never had a home, but now he holds the only blood relative in his hands he'll ever know. That and with the other children that he and Zipporah have, he finally finds a family. The Christian community, especially in Ephesus, Paul tells in his letter to Ephesians the good news of the gospel. Blessed the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven. God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless in God's presence for the creation of the world. At the moment we say yes to the offer that God makes to us, we have spiritual blessings upon spiritual blessings. And I thought this week, what are those spiritual blessings of being part 
not only is it not that God's presence and spirit is there to guide us and direct us, right? We know that the disciples on the day of Pentecost first experienced this revelation as well as the Egyptian eunuch did on the day that he found baptism. That the gift of the spirit is with us. But what else does it give us? It says in our text today that God chose us before creation to be destined to live with God eternally. That it was God's choice. It's almost as if, as a parent of a rebellious teenager, he knew that when given the options of freedom of choice, we would mess it up. And he had a plan already. His plan was to draw us back, to redeem us, to make us new once again. In Christ, we have every spiritual blessing. God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless in God's presence before the creation of the world. It's almost as if God knew that in our independence, we would choose a life at moments in which we would mess it up. But God doesn't look at us upon our actions and the accumulation of that. God looks at us as though we were designed and created. We were created to be blameless and holy. And in doing so, we can be adopted into the family. God. We are reminded by Scripture that we too, like Moses, are foreigners in a foreign land. That this is not our home. That our home is yet to come. The home that Marvin and Jean found this week. Right? He tells in the Gospel of John, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will surely come back so that you and I can be together. That Christ selfless walk to the cross and willingness to be sacrificed while gruesome in its details is awesome in its message to you and me. That there is nothing God wouldn't do to bring you home. That the life of Christ coming into the world Stained by poor choices and bad decisions of humanity and welcoming in the darkness that we see every day. That God wouldn't leave us in that situation, but would become human like us as a rescue mission to bring us back home. That's why the words, we have been ransomed, through Christ's blood are listed in our text today. And we have forgiveness for our failures based on His overflowing grace. Ransom is an exchange of one thing for another. Christ's life for our life. Sacrificially, He stepped forward and said, let me take it. That they may come to know and choose for themselves God's people. We've had a lot of debate in the history of Christendom over the question of free will or predestination. That there are streams of theological thought that say that God handpicked in the beginning who would be saved and who would not. But that's not what Martin Luther said. That's not what John Calvin said. John Calvin believed no matter what, we would be predestined to recognize and know that God is real and invites us into a relationship. And then it's our choice. Will we struggle with our adopted father and wrestle with the promise that he gives us? Or would we freely accept this child? I thought about this question this week. And I thought about a friend of mine named Ted. I worked with Ted 
Honda. I've told several of you this story, but you know, Jenny and I have had the blessing of watching the granddaughters for a weekend, and it's almost like we need a vacation day. <laughs> Ted and his wife tried everything possible to have a child. They went through all the medical procedures and everything that was available, and it just wasn't going to happen. And so at 30 years old, they put their names on an adoption list. Honda took us in our travels to France to work with a contractor there that we had hired to do some work. And I went with Ted, and Ted said, do you think it would be a problem if my wife came along? Even though it's a business trip, we're already paying for the hotel room. She has the time off, so they were kind of sneaking around, <laughs> hoping that he wouldn't get in trouble. I didn't care. They were paying her expenses out of their pocket. What do I care? Well, one night, we were sitting in a crepe shop, shop in Paris, and the phone rang. Ted, I'm guessing at this point, was about 53 years old. And they got the call that someone had chosen them to be parents and to adopt a young girl, nine months old. The joy on their faces in that moment, and I'm thinking to myself, I was much younger than that, of course. And I'm like, wow. And they said, yes. We're, on, we're, you know, we're in another country right now, but when we get home, yes. And just this week of excitement between he and his wife, and just being to be able to be in the company as when they got together, they got to talk about the possibility, you know, what are we going to do, and all the plans that had been made. The excitement to receive this child, and they did. Two years later, just after Ted turned 55, they got a call that the mother had another child, and we'd like to keep the siblings together. Would you adopt her coming newborn son? brother. Yes. He came to the lunch day one day and told us the good news and we're like, dude, when are you ever going to retire? <laughs> I mean, I think they force you at 70. I mean, your kids are not even going to be out of high school. How are you, Joe? This is a blessing. He came in dragging every morning. Right? Those two toddlers roaming around his house. But it was the greatest blessing in the world. And in that moment, I, I think I know how Sarah and Abraham felt. And Sarah became pregnant in her later years. But even more so, I think I know how God feels. What do we say? Yes. When we say sure, when the blessing and the beauty are being called his. I'm told from my readings that the genealogy of certain families were not always biological. That a family that could not afford a child could go to a family that was more wealthy and ask if that child would be adopted by a patriarch in the ancient world. And if the patriarch accepted that child in, it was his decision alone, he would pick the child up and he would carry the child around the outside of his house as a proclamation to the community. This one is mine. Can you imagine for a moment when we take our last breath in this life and our next first breath in the life to come, that God almost lifts us up, carrying us around heaven. This one is mine. As a proclamation to the heaven and to the earth, that in the final days when we would be reunited, this one is mine. Accept them into my family. Leave. That's why the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son all speak of the celebration and party that takes place when one who is lost comes home.
come today and there's a part of you that feels a bit of a misfit. There's a part of you that feels like, am I a part of it? Is there someone who would choose to accept me just for who I am? There is. The cross is our reminder of our adaption into the family of Christ. He has poured over us wisdom and understanding. God revealed his hidden design to us, which is according to his good will and the plan that he intended to accomplish through the Son. That Christ's life, death, and resurrection is a message to us that we too will be resurrected when we say yes. This is what God planned for the climax of all times to bring all things together in Christ, the things in heaven and the things on earth. We were destined by the plan of God who accomplishes everything according to his design. We are called to be an honor to God's glory because we were the first hope in Christ. Our response to the gift of being adopted is a life that gives God honor and glory that points others to the gift of salvation that God designed them to enjoy even before they were born. That we would be united according to His good will. How can we say this? Well, Paul tells you at the end, you too heard the word of truth in Christ, which is the good news of your salvation. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit because you believed in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance, which is applied toward our redemption as God's own people, resulting in His honor and in His glory. You can't wear God out. You can only give God joy. You have a place in the family of God, the moment you say yes. Friends, I'm sorry, there's no better news than that. That is the good news we preach each and every day, in heart and word and deed. That's why we can sing in God's glory that's why we can come to the table. Because regardless of the message that the world has given us of our worthlessness and uselessness, God has given us a new gift. It says, don't listen to it. That's their plan, not my plan. Enjoy the gift of salvation. It is what you were meant to be. Praise be and come up and lead us in our response to the